stories are the most powerful thing on earth. They are literally life and death. Wars are waged based on the story of who is the hero and who is the villain. You are the result of a story your parents told each other. The one night stand, the soulmate, and friends who became so much more. Life and death. So wouldn't you like to understand them better, these stories? How Story Works, an elegant guide to the crafts of storytelling by Lonnie Diane Rich, demystifies stories and helps you understand why you love what you love, why you hate what you hate, and why prologues are almost always a bad idea. How Story Works by Lonnie Diane Rich. Available on Amazon in ebook, audiobook, and paperback form. Get your copy today. Welcome to Still Pretty, a Buffy the Vampire Slayer podcast from Chipperish Media. I'm film scholar with spurty knowledge, Noelle LaCroix. <laughs> and I'm story expert who chose her major in playgroup, Lonnie Diane Rich. And we're here today to talk about The Freshman, the first episode of season four. The Freshman aired on October 5th, 1999, and was written and directed by Joss Whedon. Now, as you all know, Still Pretty is a fully spoiled Buffy podcast. That means that at any moment we can pull in things that happen in the rest of Buffy or things that happen over in Angel the Series or things that happen in our personal lives. You never know where we're going to go. <laughs> Whole point is, if you haven't watched all of Buffy and probably all of Angel, then, uh, then maybe you want to go take care of that and then come back. When it's dark and I'm all alone and I'm scared or freaked out or whatever, I always think, what would Buffy do? So let's go on patrol. In The Freshman, Buffy and Willow start their freshman year at UC Sunnydale. Willow is very excited. Oz is playing gigs at the frat houses and Xander is off on his cross-country adventure. Willow and Buffy go to get their books, and Buffy accidentally knocks a bunch of books over onto the head of a floppy-haired douchebag whose name, we will learn, is Riley. Oh, that was bracing. I'm so... the books were just too high, and then everything was bad. Let's put a few of these down here. So, uh, are you girls taking intro psych, or do you just want me dead? Oh, Riley... I think you know the answer to that. Riley tells them about the famous Dr. Maggie Walsh who teaches the class and he and Willow bond over the professor's work while Buffy is just awkward. Speaking of awkward, Buffy goes to her dorm room and meets Kathy, her super excited roommate. She goes to a class and gets yelled at by the professor and then heads to psych class where she bumps into, uh, Riley. And then, okay, this is Psych 105, Introduction to Psychology. I'm Professor Walsh. Those of you who fall into my good graces will come to know me as Maggie. Those of you who don't will come to know me by the name my TAs use and think I don't know about, the evil bitch monster of death. Well, that's some foreshadowing for you. Later that night, Buffy bumps into a kid named Eddie, and they share a map to find their way around campus. He tells her that he keeps a copy of On Human Bondage by his bed as a security blanket, and as pickup lines go, it's definitely original. But moments after leaving Buffy, Eddie gets vamped by a gang of vampires led by a blonde girl named Sunday. The vampires go into Eddie's room and empty the place, leaving a note behind that he left school. When he doesn't show up in class, Buffy goes to find him and discovers that his copy of On Human Bondage was left behind. Meanwhile, Sunday and the gang go through Eddie's stuff in their lair. Boring. <sighs> Astonishingly boring. We... We have to kill some cooler people. Will somebody remind me? Buffy goes to see Giles at his apartment and finds a British woman named Olivia wearing only his shirt and well done, Giles. Giles comes out wearing a robe and Buffy is not ready for this. She tells him that she suspects there's a gang of vampires working the campus and Giles tells her she has to learn to handle these things herself. Buffy goes back to campus to patrol and sees Eddie and follows him. She tries to talk to him. But when she realizes he's a vampire, she stakes him. Sunday and her gang step out of the darkness to introduce themselves. Wow, um, I heard you might be coming here. This is, I mean, what a challenge. The Slayer. And you are? Oh, I'm, I'm Sunday. I'll be killing you here in a minute or so. Buffy fights Sunday, but Buffy's lack of confidence shows, and Sunday gets the best of her, hurting her arms, so Buffy runs off. 
The next day, Buffy goes to visit Joyce and finds that Joyce is using her room to store packing crates for the gallery. Buffy goes back to her dorm to find her stuff gone and a note on her bed saying she'd left school. Buffy goes to the bronze and bumps into Xander and tells him about her fears that she can't cut it in this new life. Let me tell you something. When it's dark and I'm all alone and I'm scared or freaked out or whatever, I always think, what would Buffy do? You're my hero. Xander pulls Buffy out of her funk and they go to the school to research Sunday and her gang and figure out their lair is in an old condemned frat house, because of course it is. They watch through the skylight as the vamps play with Buffy's stuff. Buffy sends Xander off to get her weapons chest and then falls through the skylight into the middle of the gang. How am I gonna get out of this one? You had a nice setup here, but you made one mistake. What was that? Well, I'm not actually positive, but statistically speaking, people usually make it. While Xander gets Willow and Oz to help Buffy, Buffy fights with Sunday and gets her confidence back. Willow, Oz, and Xander come in and take out a few vamps while another runs away. Buffy takes out Sunday with a confident throw of the stake and retrieves her things. As they walk out with her boxes, Giles rushes up to her, carrying weapons. I've been awake all night. I know I'm supposed to teach you self-reliance, but I can't leave you out there to fight alone. Uh, to, to hell with what's right. I, I, I'm ready to back you up. Let's find the evil and, 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 and fight it together. Great. Thanks. We'll get right on that. The evil is this way? Later, the vampire who got away gets teased and brought down by a group of military commando guys. So, welcome to season four. All right, so Noel, here we are. It's season four. We're in a whole new space. We've got the new sets at the campus. Uh, the high school is gone. We've moved into this whole new space with Buffy and her friends. What do you think? Uh... <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I actually really like this episode. I like it a lot. There's a lot mm -hmm. of really good stuff in it. And when I was revisiting it, I was quite um, chilled by something that is supposed to be funny that just yeah. it just okay i'm gonna i'm gonna talk about campus rape okay like <laughs> this is all right all right so i guess i guess trigger warning yeah. uh we can put this in here for anybody who may be upset by the discussion of rape culture on college campuses or rape culture in general you may want to skip ahead i'd say probably about five minutes i think we'll probably get through this <laughs> i'll quickly, wrap this but... up quick i promise yeah. but okay so <laughs> The quad, so Buffy walking through the quad is this fantastic mm -hmm. sequence where she is completely overwhelmed. People yeah. are lunging at her with flyers, um, including this fraternity guy, free jello shots mm -hmm. for freshman women at the Alpha Del party. And yeah. I'm just like, I yeah. mean, fraternity, okay, fraternities are a plague. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and uh -huh. say that. That's my opinion. Um, but I mean, round of disturbed applause for this actor and his smarm, because, you know, sure. like, mm -hmm. the way he delivers mm -hmm. that line, you absolutely know what the free jello shots for freshman women thing is about. Well, I mean, that's what it is. That's what jello shots, I mean, are specifically like designed to have that kind of uh, staggered effect, right? Because you're you're taking in the jello shots, you're taking in the alcohol, but your body has to process the jello shots. So it's like a delayed effect. So a lot of times, you know, people will have a jello shot, they won't feel it, they'll have another, they won't feel it, then they'll have another. And by that time, they've got so much alcohol in their system that when it hits, it hits hard. And the fact that this is commonly used, I mean, jello shots, fruity drinks, like these are things that are used to target mm -hmm. women, right? Guys like beer, right? Women, we do jello shots to get the women drunk. Why do we want the women drunk? Because then their inhib inhibitions are down. They're more likely to say yes, or they're, or they're less likely to fight you off if they Or they're more likely to pass to, out. You know? They're more likely to pass out. Pass out, um, yeah. But yeah, the deal, I mean, obviously the deal with jello shots is they're ridiculously easy to make with ridiculously cheap booze, yes. cheap, bad booze, and mm -hmm. the sugar in the jello. Um, masks the taste of alcohol, and then when you when you solidify, they're not really solid, solid-ish. When you when you have alcohol yeah. in a solid-ish form, it doesn't dissolve as much mm -hmm. on your tongue, so it's really really easy yeah. to just they just go down super super smooth. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you know this is 
so we have this we have this gross dude being gross and we sort of know like Mm -hmm. like he's you know this actor does a great job with his one little line um and then yeah (laughs) but it's terrible though because it's free it's not free jello shots it's free jello shots freshmen freshmen women because women like that yeah. is disturbing and textual rape culture right yep. there. Like I don't care what your argument is, there is no argument against that being blatant yeah. rape so culture. Yeah. So then, you know, then Willow swoops in and I I love, mm-hmm. you know, I love it. You know, she says, I've heard about five different issues and I'm angry about each and every one of them <laughs> with this giant grin. And then they trade yes. notes. Then the, then Buffy and Willow compare flyers. She says, and Willow says, I didn't get jello shots. I'll trade you for take back the night, which is oh God. beyond chilling. It's supposed to be funny. Yeah. And I'm like, I I take back the night, of course, is the worldwide effort to combat sexual violence um, and violence against women and take back the night, mm-hmm. you know, historically um, happened on college campuses, yeah. you know, to mm-hmm. raise awareness of campus rape and sexual assault. So this this yep. idea, I can't like I just it aligning these two things in a joke. That's yeah, like that is it's almost like it's like there was the punch in the face for the free jello shots for mm-hmm. freshman women. Then there's the oh, I didn't get jello shots yeah. um, as though it's, it's a, a compliment, compliment as to though be it's targeted a good thing, as though it's yes. right. And then the left hook of I'll trade you for take back the night. All of this together is such a horrible swarm of killer bee things. It's terrible. And it happens so quickly. And it's done in this really charming way. And that is just the, Mm -hmm. that is, you know, the the poison of this kind of writing and then there's this you know because we got to do a three beat right we got to do the we got to do the campus rape three beat so oz's friend paul shows up and that whole interaction is funny you know oz knows his way around he knows what what all is happening i know it's so great we'll talk about oz in a minute um but (laughs) you know paul says of the alpha delta party i'm bringing the wrecking crew jello shots uh-huh. Is I mean, that feels like I understand the idea of like the wrecking crew being like the you know, the gang's all here, like all the guys who like to go out and party, but then Right. They're gonna get drunk and they're gonna tear the place apart. But in the context of everything else, right in that mm-hmm. space. Like not yeah, right. it's the mm-hmm. there's like it's those <laughs> it's those small moments that have really, really chilling undertones that get me and i just like yeah the the trading the trading the the frat flyer for the take back the night Mm -hmm. i just mm -hmm, i'm so uncomfortable (laughs) it is it's all really really uncomfortable and it it and the thing is that he's like i'm bringing the wrecking crew and then he's like jello shots you know and and so the uh, all of these things clearly and cleanly associated with each other in a way that i do not think is deliberate which almost makes it worse because it's it's rape culture is so seeped into our consciousness that it is just associated with college yes. culture that it is aligned so clearly that like you can't talk about college without having all of these these assault and rape insinuations that are played as mm-hmm. funny and mm-hmm. fun and a good time for everybody involved especially those freshman yep. women you know, who are being looked at, you know, in a very predatory manner. So all of this stuff put together um, makes me feel real good about my youngest daughter going off to college in a couple of weeks. So I'm, I'm feeling good about that. Yeah. Um, I've already talked to her about Jello Shots. We're good. <laughs> oh, um, but <clears throat> but it's, you know, I mean, it's it's disturbing and disturbing even more so in the fact that it comes off with such incredible innocence and mm-hmm. fun. You know, with it, with it, that tone not being, um, you know, not having the dark shadows that that are are there. Yeah. The dark shadow of the episode actually ends up being mm-hmm. Buffy's feeling like she can't cut it. You know, she was she yeah. was a big ish fish in a small ish pond. I mean, yeah. she she knew mm-hmm. she was in her groove. 
you know, and she was right. mm-hmm. class protector, which is so sweet and wonderful. Which is sweet. And then she comes to I college. Know. She's completely overwhelmed. The way that, that um, you know, rape jokes aside, the way that quad scene is filmed mm-hmm. is yeah. Mm-hmm. lovely it is so yes so mm-hmm. the experience of being in that kind of crowded high energy environment where mm-hmm. there are a million yep. things going on and i'm definitely in the wrong place i don't know where i'm supposed to be you know <laughs> i just like yeah. that that piece of it is really really fantastic yeah and yeah the but to have that kind of you know it doesn't it's a it's a rape joke three beat that doesn't pay off because that's not what we're doing. We're just building the campus. We're just building right. the culture of a college campus as opposed to yeah. folding that into the story. Um, and exactly. that to yeah. me is what makes that one that that to me is what makes any joke that is kind of, you know, the dark underbelly of a situation. Um mm-hmm. Right. More or less effective. You know, for me personally, like Mm -hmm. if we're joking about something that's really dark, but then we address that dark issue later on, Mm -hmm. I almost feel like, okay, like the the joke, it's like um, it's like a Chekhov's gun thing (laughs) as opposed to just. Yes. As opposed to just, you know, having the joke be campus rape, you know, like that's right. That's not a joke. That's not a, it's not a no, joke. No. You didn't have to do it. And then, okay, as long as I'm staking things, to borrow your phrase yes, from Still no, Dead. Yes, no, go. From Still Willow's Dead, right, yes. fucking spurty knowledge thing. Uh, it's so uh, uh, fucking uh, written. Uh, and it's so written by yes. a man. And I yes. just... Yes. Like, yes, you're very funny. You don't, that's not an accidental metaphor that well, you use. And no. like... No, Clearly. it's yeah. so written. It is so obviously written mm-hmm. by a man for a woman to say. And I just, I hate it. I hate mm-hmm. it. I hate 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 it. <laughs> okay. I I completely support that. I, I found it really annoying too. Um, and especially because like it started out as something where she could have stopped herself, you know, but then when she's like, and thrust into my brain with its thir- <laughs> with its spurty knowledge, I was like, you've got to be fucking kidding me with this. Like, I don't know. Um, yeah, that was uh, that was bad. I think that was something like the the campus rape stuff is something in the '90s. You would have been like, yeah, okay, yeah, you know. But like the like that is even something that I think in the '90s people would be rolling their eyes at. It's just it's just really really bad. Um, so yeah, but aside from that though, aside from this from Willow, like everything Willow in this episode is a goddamn delight. <laughs> I love seeing Willow in her element. I love her being so excited about school. I love her being nerdy about all the classes. Like I remember what that felt like when you were looking at your, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm that nerd. Like I would get so excited about all these things I was going to learn about and all these like new s- things that I could get classes in that like when you're in, in high school, you're very limited in the classes that you can choose but when you get to college like you can meet your requirements learning about things that you're actually excited about and that is college is amazing I mean it honestly is one of the best times like for everybody I think like at least at least nerdy people who are really into like learning new shit like that's which is why it should be Um, federally funded and free for everybody okay that's (laughs) yes absolutely Absolutely. Education is the silver bullet. Number one issue on which we have to, if we vote on education, everything else will fall into place. But anyway, long story short, uh, Willow's fantastic. Her hair, I love her spiky new hairdo. I love how cool she is. I love how she's, you know, she's gone from being this like really awkward, nerdy type, you know, in the high school to uh, to being in control and being like you know the big woman yeah. on campus and she knows her shit i love it i love all of it i think it's fantastic they've even given her a little bit of a lift in her shoe i don't think yeah i was ne- she, she seems seems taller. taller yeah i was never aware yeah. of allison hannigan being taller than sarah michelle geller uh, but no, in the, in you know season four episode one willow is you know she is large and in charge yeah. i mean She's yeah. So oh gosh, she's so great in her confidence. I and I love her. I love her trying to be Buffy's like 
academic doula. You know, you I could take, know. oh, you could take this class. Oh, you could take this class. It's, yes. I, I mean, I was also that nerd. I'm still it's that so nerd. Fun. Are you kidding right? me? Like, I'm like, <laughs> still that nerd. Um, I love, yeah. I love seeing Willow so excited about being in college. Uh-huh. It's just delightful. Yes. And it makes me want to go back to college. <laughs> I know. It doesn't, really it, does. doesn't it? You look at it that really college. Does. I go to college every day because I work at a college, but I still don't feel that. Like when I watch this, I feel mm-hmm. what that was like. Yeah. You know? um, it's, it's so yeah, fantastic. Because, yeah. I love it. And we spend a lot of time. It's really, you know, I talked a little bit about the moving through the quad opening scene, but when yeah. Willow and mm-hmm. Buffy start to walk together, we walk with them, which is really nice. The camera yeah. just kind of comes with them. Yeah. And we spend a lot of time in front of them. So we're actually moving backwards and they're coming toward us. Yeah. Which has this really, mm-hmm. really lovely effect of feeling like we're part of the group, but also getting to see their yeah. facial expressions and see that, you know, mm-hmm. that excitement yeah. from Willow and the kind of, you know, uncomfortable um feeling of being disoriented from Buffy yeah and then that reveal Mm -hmm. with the library where we swing the camera around and we get to I think there's a little bit of a fisheye lens happening too to make it yeah I think so too vast Mm -hmm. and we really get that giving us that wider yeah that sense Mm -hmm. of awe at you know Mm -hmm. every And it's so beautiful. beautiful And I love Willow being like, I didn't want to hurt Giles' feelings. But aside from the cult, there wasn't much of a selection. (laughs) She's just so into all of it. I love it so much. I I love it. I love it. I love it. But poor Buffy, though. Oh, man. Like, Mm -hmm. when when Oz joins up with Willow and Buffy as they're walking along, and Buffy makes this bid for connection, like, please tell me you're overwhelmed too. And Oz is like, yes. oh yeah, it's super overwhelming. And then is completely, <laughs> completely smooth, you know, knows where everything yeah. is, is waving to people, points everyone in the right direction. <laughs> and then yeah. is so, you know, in his like lovely Aussian way, is like, oh yeah, but it's all super yeah. new. <laughs> like, <he's> like, exactly. <laughs> But he's been playing gigs on campus mm-hmm. for ages. Like he, you know, he knows all this stuff. So, um, yeah, it's really, really fun. I love, I love the challenge of Buffy being out of her element. I love that we give her this crisis of confidence in this new space. I think that's a wonderful way to kind of like transition us from, you know, the high school story, which we got in the first three seasons, to this new space that we're in, which is more of the adult Buffy story, you know, or the adult-ish mm-hmm. Buffy story, you know, Um, and so I love that we have her, you know, feeling isolated, feeling challenged, not feeling like the slayer and what that confidence does, you know, what, what, how powerful confidence is because she has all these capabilities. She hasn't lost her capabilities, not like helpless where Mm -hmm. she suddenly doesn't have the strength of a slayer anymore. It's totally a head game. You know, it's in her confidence. She's got the yips, Mm -hmm. you know. And um, and so it's really kind of nice to see her put in that kind of challenge, kind of isolated. Um, you know, she has this roommate, <laughs> like this weirdo, super excited roommate who loves Celine Dion, you know, which, um, which is wonderful. Like, again, you know, like again, with like the casual misogyny that like if a, if a, mm-hmm. a young woman likes it, it must be mockable. Um, now, yes. having a roommate mm-hmm. who snores and smacks her lips in the night is not great. But having yeah. a roommate who has, you know, who likes pop music, what, whatever, yeah. guys. Like, what? I mean, yeah. No, there is a lot of, you know, you're right. There is a lot of taste shaming that goes on, especially at a college campus. And honestly, taste shaming is the, like, you know, kind of like the the area of the insecure. People who have to taste shame other people for the things that they like. And I mean, let's not, you know, let's not dick around, right? Chipperish media, our whole theme is love what you love. Yeah. (laughs) Like, you know. Taste shaming is something that you do when you're insecure about your yourself and your, you know, intellectual abilities or whatever, or your own tastes, you know, and so you, you make fun of other people. Um, that said, I did love the shot where Kathy oh, puts up the great. Celine Dion poster and then grins back over her shoulder. She's it's so, so happy. It's so great. You know, like, so it was Especially kind of because mm-hmm. we framed this as, you know, we have this idea 
this little undercurrent of coolness that runs yeah. through the episode. Yeah. So, you know, she says, Kathy says to Buffy, you're cool, I can tell. And then plasters cool, her Celine Dion poster on the wall. And I'm just like, <laughs> I love, I love Kathy. I love. I love the moment, too, where Oz and Willow are in there trying to figure out what happened with Buffy. And Willow's like, she doesn't just leave. Well, except for that one time. But there were circumstances. And Kathy's like, wait a minute. Does she have emotional problems? Because I specifically asked for a stable yes. non-smoker. And I was like, <laughs> yep. I loved that. <laughs> yep. I, I, I actually kind of love Kathy. I feel sort of... I kind I of mean, love Kathy, too. Probably, probably because partly I was a little bit of that in college that like super excited uh -huh. to be here and just like so yeah. you know stoked to meet everybody and right I also really like honestly I think enthusiasm is one of the most attractive qualities in a person and especially enthusiasm that is that will not yes. be shamed will put up Celine Dion and tell you to <laughs> fuck off like I I love enthusiasm in people honestly if people are enthusiastic about something generally I don't care what it is if they are so excited that they will talk my ear off for 45 minutes about this thing like I love it and I usually by the end of the conversation I'm like oh my god you're right monarch butterflies are so cool <laughs> you know um, I get that way too like enthusiasm ends up being infectious and it is such a what a wonderful thing to feel what a wonderful emotion to have enthusiasm like it is a joyful experience. So for me, when somebody shares their enthusiasm with me, it's like somebody coming up to you and giving you like a wonderful glass of wine or a big box of chocolates. It's so awesome, you know. So um, so we use enthusiasm to uh, to make fun of people because cool, yeah. right? Cool is the opposite of enthusiastic. Cool is like, yeah, I'm, I'm chill, whatever, I don't care, you know. Cool is also running away from vulnerability. Cool is, um, cool isn't cool. Cool is stupid. I hate cool. I hate cool people. Except Oz. Um, we love Oz. Except Oz. Well, Oz is cool in a different way. Because he's still like, he loves his music, he loves Willow, he's still emotionally invested in things. He's not using his cool to avoid vulnerability. His cool comes from his ability to stay calm, right? You know, like when Willow's like, how can you be so calm? And he's like, years of arduous practice. That's you know, like, brilliant. he's. That is a brilliant line, by the way. I know. Oz is the goddamn best. I love Oz. Um, so I, I, you know, Oz is cool is a different kind of cool from the self-protective. I'm not going to like anything because that makes me vulnerable kind of cool. I'm going to mock other people's uh, enthusiasm, other people's music choices, other people's whatever, because they have the bravery to actually love something and care about it. And I'm too worried about how I come off to people like um, that kind of cool is bullshit. No, Oz, Oz cool. I, maybe there needs to be a different word. Yeah, you know? it's tricky. Maybe Oz is chill. I don't know what Oz is, <laughs> but I love, I love yeah. the exchange between Oz and Xander when Xander says, "Do oh, we hug?" Yeah. And Oz says, <laughs> "No, we're too manly." I think we're, I think we're too manly. And it's this <laughs> lovely, self-aware, yes. moment between them. Of, I know because I think, I think a hug between them would be warranted except for the the past that they have you know the history that they have no i think they're completely over it and i actually also kind of object to the idea that you know men don't hug men don't have affection for like i have a whole thing which i'm not going to go into now but like the damage that we do to men by not allowing them to safely express just affection for yeah. each other, to safely express emotions, whatever they are, you know? Um, I think that's that's very, very damaging to men um, and why I think at the, at the core root of a lot of the problems that we have with, with men and violence, I think comes from that, 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 that bottling up of whatever emotion. I would have loved to have seen Xander hug Oz instead of throw himself over a woman he has never met um, and then hold her while he says, I don't know you do. Yeah. This is awkward, isn't it? Um, you know, yeah, don't don't touch somebody. Don't <laughs> hug somebody unless you know them. You know they're a hugger. And if you just if you're at the point where it's like your first hug with somebody, you say, hey, are you a hugger? Is that OK? You know, um, I'm a hugger and that's fine. But like you have to like allow people that space. Some people are not huggers and do not want to be touched <laughs> by your big grabby hands, Xander. <laughs> well, and it's so funny because I just I don't know why I I give that moment a pass but I really do I think because Xander is yeah. so enthusiastic 
And I do love Xander, and th from this point forward, Xander's I, I like. Xander, well, okay. okay. No, I hate I hate a lot of Xander. I hate Xander with Anda, Anya, but <laughs> everything else. Like I love we'll get there. <laughs> I love pep talk Xander. I love inspirational Xander. All that kind of stuff. But anyway, yeah, I understand why you give him a pass. I don't. Yeah, it makes I mean, me really uncomfortable when he grabs this woman that he doesn't know. Like it, you know, yeah, because for the joke, and it's very, very again, it's very written. It's a yes. very written, and joke. I think. You Honestly, know? I think that's probably why I feel okay with it because it feels mm -hmm. very written. It feels very safe. Um, yeah, maybe. it doesn't mm -hmm. feel. It doesn't feel assaulty in the way that a, yeah. an unexpected hug from a stranger, like no, a hug that you then hold no. while talking in her ear yeah. and saying, "I don't know, I don't you, know do you, I? do I? This is really interesting, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. yeah, it fucking is. Let her go." If you've already realized that, you have to realize that in order to vocalize it. So let her let her go, you know. Um, <laughs> but the the but, yeah. Xander frozen, but it is also cute. Like yeah. the Xander frozen mm -hmm. in his moment of enthusiasm, yes, of totally works for me. And then to have that <laughs> that bit with Oz, where yeah. I don't think it's about. I don't think Oz literally means we're too manly to hug, as in men don't hug. Uh -huh. I think he yeah. is trying to protect Xander from his own vulnerability. Like Xander, I think Xander Aww. and Oz would like to hug. I think that that's yeah. a little bit of like, I, I, I think Xander and Oz could cuddle and take a nap and it would just be fine. <laughs> What's that? Men Tylenol PM and warm cuddle. milk. <laughs> <laughs> Oh God! And now we're back to Jello shots. Yeah, so, and and gay um, panic and friends. That and was a gay friends panic, all of it. Yes, that was a friends. Not reference, a, this yes. is not a friends um, podcast. So. It's not. It's not. But it could be because we'll spoil the fuck out of anything. Like we don't care. We don't care. We will spoil any '90s television show that you can name. And, we will spoil and it. probably some classic movies that if you haven't seen, oh, you sure. know. <laughs> oh, sure. Oh, sure. Yes. Um, all right. So uh, we also have a moment where we uh, are introduced to the original floppy haired douchebag. Yes. The floppy haired douchebag is um, an archetype that I have <laughs> a term that I have coined for this archetypal uh, character who is the charming, you know, so funny, so cute, so witty, uh, you know, like overly written, always, always overly written. Well, that was bracing. Like this is, this is, you know, <sighs> Riley. Riley is the OHFD, the original floppy haired douchebag. He is the guy that I named this, uh, this idea for. And the floppy haired douchebag does show up almost everywhere, especially, especially in teen dramas in the nineties. Um, <laughs> but honestly, though, like Riley in this episode is not that bad. I, I liked Riley in the beginning. Like, I love that he's all academically excited with mm -hmm. Willow. And when he sees Buffy, I love that he refers to her as Willow's friend because Buffy is I mean, OK, first of all, this is, you know, they're all strikingly beautiful. Like, let's not say that Willow is not a freaking knockout because she is right. But Willow is not portrayed that way. Willow is portrayed as the nerdy academic and Buffy is, you know, the pretty beautiful one that everybody falls in love mm -hmm. with. Right. You know, what I mean, yeah. that's kind of like how how this how this is portrayed. So I like the fact that Riley with Buffy's unbelievable beauty right in his face is like, oh, you're Willow's friend because he was all excited about talking to Willow about, you know, psychology and Maggie Walsh and all of that stuff. And that was the connection that he made. So I liked that, you know, he's he's overwritten in the beginning. The books fall on his head. Yeah, that's bracing. Are you taking the class or did you just want me dead? Like all of that kind of, it is classic, classic floppy hair douchebag. Like that's classic floppy hair douchebag material. But <laughs> I kind of like, I, I, I kind of like him in this episode. Like the Riley yeah. hate is not here yet. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> but it's not here yet. <laughs> I have, I have very mixed feelings on Riley. Like always. Yes. Always, always, always. Uh -huh. Um, partly because I just get so distracted by Mark Blucas's yeah. like beautiful, beautiful self that I'm like, oh, oh okay. Yeah. Yes, Riley. Whatever you say. Oh, are you Riley. pulled in by the pretty? He's so pretty, Lonnie. He's so <laughs> he is pretty. Really pretty. He is, he is so I love I love a pretty, pretty man. I'm sorry. Mm. Um Yeah. It's a problem for me. I don't trust pretty men. <laughs> I have yeah. a problem with. Yeah, I mean, men. I don't. <laughs> a 
Oh, I didn't say I trusted them. (laughs) I'm just very attracted to them. I'm very drawn to them. I get it. And you know what? That's okay. Yeah, I have um, questionable taste occasionally. Um, But no, Riley, in this episode, (laughs) occasionally. Occasionally I do. Sometimes Mm -hmm. I get it right. Mm -hmm. Hey. Um, Yeah, you do. But Riley in this episode is, I mean, he is kind of adorable in his pro- academia way like i love i love uh-huh. the way he tells buffy to have fun in class <laughs> she's going to sit down he's like have fun i'm like what a weird but adorable thing to say to someone but it is fun though class is so fun. fun but not so that's fun. not a thing that people say in the world like you wouldn't send someone oh. off to i mean i would but i generally would. speaking i don't know but yeah most people don't but mm-hmm. yeah and i love I love Riley's relationship with Maggie Walsh. I yeah. love his sort of like I don't know. It's a little it's a little hero worshipy, but also yeah. there's that power mm-hmm. dynamic that we find out so much more mm-hmm. about that I really love. Um yeah. and I mean speaking of questionable taste, like Maggie Walsh, you guys. Yeah. I'm going to be honest with everyone <laughs> right now. <laughs> Season four. It's a season of honesty. Maggie Walsh is the kind of teacher I usually have the biggest intellectual heart on for. So please, like, please keep me in check. Lonnie, everyone, please keep me in check. Mm -hmm. Call me out if I'm, like, blindsided by her bullshit because my (laughs) desire to take her and her lesbian haircut to bed for the weekend is so intense. Like, it's, I can't. Okay, I love it. I love that you love Maggie Walsh because I fucking hate I Maggie Walsh. From minute one, I hate Maggie, Maggie Walsh. Walsh. She's obnoxious. No. I hate her whole attitude. <laughs> I hate everything about her. Um, but I also like, we also have this, though, like this dickish professor oh thing going on. God. You know, we've got the guy from the pop culture class. And I'm not going to lie. I take it personally. I teach a pop yeah. culture class. And you know what? When somebody comes into my class who's not on the list, I say, hey, hang out if you like the class sign this paper Mm -hmm. and magically you will be because you can add a class it's so weird (laughs) it's a thing that people do what it's just (sighs) this dickish thing like from that professor in you know this this big lecture hall and and also and also hey blonde girl fuck you dude like yeah that is so I don't know it's so demeaning and it's so like insulting and I'm insulted both like you know from the perspective of the students that that's bullshit and that's abuse and that's not how professors should be Mm -hmm. speaking to anybody Um, but also like as a professor like I teach I'm really super nice to people like I don't do that to students because that's mean and dickish and I'm sure there are professors you know I'm trying to oh I've had I've had that professor like I, I don't think I've had I that, have professor. Had that professor. Like, I have known of that professor. I yes, that professor. That scene hits me yeah. hard in the like academic shame Ooh. feels because I'm like oh. I know this guy. Like I know this guy. Yes, but academic shame. Oh my god! Like all shaming is oh, bad. It's... We're gonna get to the fat shaming in just a second because I'm pissed <laughs> off about that too. Um, but like academic shame to me, shaming somebody who is in an environment to learn, which is a very vulnerable environment. Yes. You know, to shame somebody in that circumstance makes my flames <laughs> on the side of my face. Like Thank you. that somebody who's trying to learn, yes. and you shame them, like. No, that's not how it works, you know, and I mean, it's one thing to have a class where you have expectations, you know, where you say you will be here on time, you will be professional, you will not Mm -hmm. be on your phone, you will not be like, I do that stuff, you know, you just have to lay down boundaries and expectations on the first day. But when people come in, and they want to take your class, you know, I mean, good freaking God, what a I, that was terrible. So I'm very, very sorry that you had that experience. And I am going back in time to curse whoever those assholes are who shame people who are trying yeah. to learn. Because well, and that. it's ridiculous mm-hmm. because a lot of times I think 
certainly in academic environments, it comes from that like, well, I'm the big professor and you're the little student. It's like, dude, you were a student oh, it's, at one point, you know? Exactly. Like, and it's intellectual insecurity. It's just all that is. Any professor who is secure in themselves and in their what they have to offer and in their knowledge and their intelligence doesn't do that shit. You know, and again, it's different from laying down boundaries in a class. Yeah. I also think it's just kind of hilarious and perfect that it's the pop culture professor who right. has like all of this deep insecurity about the sure. like the seriousness of what he's teaching that yes. he has to because nobody takes that yeah, serious yeah he has mm -hmm. to like mm -hmm. inflate himself in this way by you know being Ugh. a pompous asshole anyway anyway Ugh. shaming Ugh. shaming is bullshit yes, so. and it says more about shaming the person doing it than the person on the receiving yes. end so Yes, yes, it does. So if anybody has shamed you, it's not about you. It's about them and their insecurities. Speaking of which, um, so we move into, we got a couple incidences of fat shaming, one of which comes from Sunday, who is an evil vampire. So, okay, fine. When the, the other vampire says, does this, does this make me look fat? And she goes, no, the fact that you're fat makes you look fat. This just makes you look purple. Um, like, it's, you know, it's a shitty thing to say, but it's coming though? from an evil Vampire. See, yeah. okay. When she says the fact that you're fat makes you look fat. But that's fat. just factual. Like, I mean, and I'm not, I'm not, she says it in a mean way and it's meant to be mean, but I don't think that, like, I don't know. I'm a big, I'm a big proponent of like taking fat as a descriptive word and not as something right. that has a negative connotation. Now, later on, when yes. our, our, fat vampire who's like the the smallest fat possible because of course she is still female and still has she's to be, hollywood fat she's, she's like a size 10 Fuck yeah off. it's like yeah, it's exactly. obnoxious um but yeah. you know later when she says i'm hungry and sunday says uh, you know something like of course you are or, that's a surprise or you know something snarky yeah that is fat shaming but i think that mm -hmm. i actually really like the that just makes you look purple <laughs> like line it's mean it's mean we're doing the yeah. mean girl thing but i mean mm -hmm. i want to let's poke some holes in the idea that clothing is supposed to make us look as thin as possible that flattering clothing right. is really just mm -hmm. code for oh it makes you look thin um that thin right. is somehow yes. you know Thin is somehow mm -hmm. the thing and that like looking right. fat is the worst possible thing, second only to actually being fat. I'm, I mean, that's where the fat right. shaming in this line comes in. But I yeah. like personally enjoy the the notion that no, it doesn't it, like you. Can, right. And if, if it was if it was done in a way that didn't have shame rippling through every element of it, then I would I would see because I say like saying that somebody is fat is like saying somebody is tall or somebody is short or somebody is blonde hair. Like it's just like part of, you know, how their their body is, you know, and, and the association of fat with being wrong and being shameful you know, um, is something that we have so deeply ingrained into our culture that I don't think that you, I mean, you know, take back the word fat. Yeah, that's definitely something that you can do. But the fact of the matter is that fat in and of itself is a hugely shaming term. And it, it, it cannot be separated from its cultural connotation. I don't think, I don't think you can take back. Fat. Well, I don't, I think that fat is always going to be something that is going to be, it shouldn't be. And I think you're right in the idealism of that idea. Um, but I don't think that you can separate it from that cultural connotation. Well, I personally, I mean, just to be clear, I personally cannot reclaim fat because I move through the world as a thin person, um, uh -huh. by which I mean, like, the world is set up for me, um, people my <laughs> size. But, um, I mean, there are, fat activism is a thing. Um, fat activism is actually yeah. where the body positive movement started um yes. which mm -hmm. you know everybody can read up on because body positive is not meant to be you know love your body um it's meant mm -hmm. to be rights and and fair you know equal treatment and respect yeah. for people of size that is what yes. <laughs> that's what yeah. body positivity is supposed to be fat liberation look it up read about it but mm -hmm. yes i'm i'm pro also i'm just pro fat vampires like could we have some more body I diversity <laughs> among vampires 
Oh, on television? No. no 20 years ago, absolutely cannot. not. What do you know? <laughs> we cannot. Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, yeah. Um, we, we, got, we get a little bit more, you know, as with, but even so, like uh, Hollywood fat is seriously like a size 10. You know, I it's mean, like, and so it, it, ridiculous. it's disturbing. It's disturbing and it, it contributes to a lot of our cultural problems with that. Um, but all of this, you know, being from the mean girl, being from Sunday, the evil vampire, like, you know, all right, fair enough. Like, she's supposed to be a bitch. Yeah. She's evil. She's a demon. It's fine. <laughs> but then Buffy, we have Buffy watching from above as they're looking at her clothes. And she says, that's my skirt. You're never going to fit into that with that with mm-hmm. those hips. Right. And she is throwing like a fat shirt shaming insult at you know at whichever vampire was holding up the, i have no idea if it's it was the, if it was the yeah. vampire no it's sunday. Yeah, it's sunday who is so we're so we're fat shaming sunday right and just like that being the choice like okay that being the choice of insult to go from woman to hashtag woman written by a man like also <laughs> hashtag mm, written by a man yeah it feels there you i go. mean yeah. which is not to say that women don't fat shame women Women do this to each other all you know the time. it's not yeah. to say that it doesn't happen but it feels it feels um lazy it feels like lazy writing like oh yeah of course you yeah. know we're gonna have a line about how buffy is thinner than her you mm-hmm. know than the the villain of the week and that makes her better and that makes her superior fucked because up. she's smaller it's fucked up yeah. it's so fucked up it is it is this is why women are such a mess <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway. this, this is this is like this is just a teeny tiny micro just a just a sprinkling just a light patriarchal yes. glaze on why women are a mess exactly <laughs> why women are fucked oh up God. because our culture hates us yes misogyny is in the culture don't tell me it's not in the culture i'm not gonna have that argument <laughs> anyway um i think maybe it's time to take a little break and talk about our uh, our patreon support all right This episode of Still Pretty is brought to you by UC Sunnydale. UC Sunnydale offers programs in all the major academic disciplines, as well as the exciting possibility that a vampire might eat you before midterms. UC Sunnydale, providing equal opportunity education for people and demons since 1886. Hey, isn't Clive supposed to be doing these for us? Where is Clive anyway? Tell me he's in jail. I'll tell you about it later. But if you're not into sponsoring education, you could give your money directly to Chipperish Media so that we can keep making the great podcasts you love. Lonnie. Like Still Dead about Angel the Series, Listen Up A-Holes about the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Orgasm about Explosive Inspiration, our Star Wars podcast, Metaphors Be With You, and of course, How Story Works, a primer podcast on basic narrative theory. Lonnie. What? Where's Clive? Lonnie? I fixed the leak in the bathroom sink and I'm about to head to the store. Is there anything I should add to the list? Clive, I'm recording. Oh, so sorry. I'll bugger off then. See you later. Oh, tampons. Right, right. Adding to the list. He's still there. Visit patreon.com slash chipperish to find out more. Seriously? We're not going to talk about this. He fixes things. He runs errands. You know I hate going to the grocery store. Lonnie, where is he sleeping? The basement. Oh, dear God. God, I hope that's not a euphemism. All right, so I think it's maybe time that we start talking about Xander. How about we talk about Xander? Let's talk about Xander. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> <God>. <laughs> so you know, we talked a bit about light Xander and shadow Xander and kind of how we've had this war um, between the two of them during the high school years. And now we're kind of getting this new, oh, God, this new shade of Xander, which I really, really love, which is inspirational pep talk you know, counselor Xander, um, you know, where he can be the one. And this is something that like we've been, we're building up and we're going to build up through the next, you know, four seasons. Um, This idea of Xander being the one who sees Xander being the one who can kind of isolate where the problems are, can counsel you through your issues, can talk you through things, can inspire you and make you feel ready to go out and just take on the world, you know? Um, And this is like my favorite flavor of Xander. I, I love this guy. I love when he sits down with her and he says, you know, when I'm scared, when I'm afraid, I ask myself, what would Buffy do? You're my hero, you know? Um, And also like it brings in this idea of hero worship from Xander, which I think feeds into his relationship with Buffy. Like in the, in the first like high school years, the first definitely two seasons and, you know, a hint maybe in the third, although I think we dropped it. Like he's got this, you know, sexual romantic interest in Buffy and sees her, 
you know, as as the girl who didn't want him, right? You know, who rejected him or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but now we move into this this hero worship where Xander sees Buffy as the hero, you know, that she is. Of course she is, you know, um, but that he really recognizes that and that that's what he does. He looks up to her, you know, um, he idolizes her. Uh, he asks himself, what would Buffy do, right? And that is such a sweet and touching thing. Um, but I think it's going to also add an interesting element as we move forward through the series to their relationship, to the way that he sees her, to what happens when he's disappointed in her. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's it's really, really interesting. And of course, Xander follows it up because this was written by Joss Whedon uh, with the Shadow Xander, classic Shadow Xander line. Sure, sometimes I think, what is Buffy wearing? You know, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it doesn't bother me so much here because it almost feels self-aware. It almost feels like he's doing that joke to kind of cut that that huge emotional moment to make it a little more comfortable for her and to take himself down. It feels rather than aggressive toward her. It feels self-deprecating toward Shadow Xander, toward gross Xander. Um, and he seems aware of it. I don't know. How did you read that? I I can go both ways with that. I didn't. Mm -hmm. I didn't love that whole, like, Xander Ex Machina scene yeah. in the bronze. I was uh -huh. not, like, I appreciate what's happening there, and I like where that is going. You know, like, every basically everything you just said, yes, and um, I'm also yeah. just, it feels, again, it feels super written. It feels really clunky. Uh -huh. And I like the idea, well, I like the idea of Xander using some like self-deprecating humor to mm -hmm. kind of undercut the vulnerability of the situation for both of them. Yeah. Um, I just like, really mm -hmm. <laughs> like you had to spoil the moment with yeah. this, like, you know, what is Buffy, you know, when I'm, when I'm alone in the dark, what is oh, Buffy God. wearing? Like, <laughs> no, no. You know, and she says, can that be one of the things you never tell me about? Right. But and it's clearly like they're both smiling and it's clearly mm -hmm. a like a companionable moment between them. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't know. I don't I don't love it. I don't love it. Although yeah. I do. There is Xander that I love in this mm -hmm. episode. I yeah. love them. I love them in research mode together. Oh, yes. God yes. damn. This so is so fun. good. I know. And I love that he's the one who picked it up. He was like, 1982. I have that right here. And let yes. me just show you. I have the whole history of this frat house. And I figured it all out. I like that moment of capability for Xander. Yeah, that he knows what to do. Yeah. He knows, and he's very cute about mm -hmm. like, wait, there are vampires? Like, where is everybody? Rally the troops. Let's go. Let's do this thing. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, he's, I like I like him as the encourager. Yeah. I like him as the, you know, you got this. Right. And I'm here to help you guy. But the, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. This, yeah. it, like, it, it, very, it feels very... Xander Ex Machina in that yeah. scene in the bronze. I also don't buy his story about where he was. Uh, like, I right. don't. Uh-uh. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Well, that, that story also feels incredibly written. So, you know, written. I mean, and this so is the written. thing with Joss Whedon is that Joss Whedon is a brilliant writer, but he does fall into this space. Um, it's an Aaron Sorkin ish kind of space. Sorkin does this, too, although when Sorkin does it, it's mostly with this um, beautiful musical dialogue. It's almost like a, a musical theater, you know, thing. So with Sorkin, I, I have a lot more forgiveness for it than with uh, with Whedon. Um, but Whedon um, has this this ability to like really overcook the dough when it comes to the way that he writes and he and that whole run for Xander was super overwritten yep and you can hear Nick mm -hmm. Brendan reading like you can yep. hear him yeah reciting these words that have been written for him to say it does not yeah. feel like Natural something dialogue. that just occur to him to say um, right yeah you know which is not to say that all dialogue needs to be naturalistic mm -hmm. dialogue no um but it doesn't it doesn't work for me and it really it's, doesn't it's work for me overcooked yeah. it doesn't work for me as coming from xander especially mm -hmm. yeah but yeah no you know i can see that that's just me that's just me i can see that I we can are see gonna that. we're gonna butt heads on xander lots of times i suspect um that is totally fine as long as you know like we we both like i just want one of us to love everything at some point like when we both hate on everything 
<laughs> well, we both hate oh, on the same thing. Sure. I always like, feel bad I try because to... we're taking it down. Yeah. I am here with all of the Maggie Walsh love forever good. and ever. I'm so glad Amen. because I, I hate her. her. I love so her so much. much. <laughs> oh, good. I'm so glad. Um, okay. So one thing that I do love, though, of course, is Rove Giles. <laughs> I squeed on your behalf. I was like, oh my God. Lonnie's I was be- like, Giles in a robe. And then I was like, oh, is he only wearing a robe? But he had pants on. He had like he has pants pajama on. pants on. Yeah, it was a little bit disappointing. But I love the fact that he's got a hot friend in from out of town for some great just friends sex. Like, I think that that's fantastic. Go, Giles. She's beautiful. She's British. She's smart. She calls him Ripper, but doesn't know that he's a watcher. <laughs> So knows that he has a dangerous background, but doesn't know that he's a watcher because they they keep the fact that or, Buffy's the slayer from her. So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit. It's a little bit weird. But I love Olivia. I wish we got more Olivia. I know. I know. I mean, we don't get near enough. I think we get her in this and we get her in Hush. And is that it? I, I think, think that's, that's all we get. It. I think but that's it's it. Nice. I don't think we see her I again. I like her, though. I like her. And, you know, goodness knows we could use, like, some characters of color in here. would have been nice if she had been, like, a bigger part of the story. But right. at and... least she's there. Yeah. <laughs> at least, you know, at least we get that. Yeah. Um, it's something. Um, I love Buffy's discomfort about Giles having sex. And he's like, what? I can't have a private life. And she goes, no, because you're very, very old and it's gross. You know, <laughs> I that is one of my favorite lines in the whole series. It is so fun. <laughs> very, <I'm> very old. <laughs> I just I love I love her. This is a bad time. Is this a bad time? This seems like a bad time. Bad time. <laughs> like, and Giles is like truly baffled. He's like, mm-hmm. what are you talking about? No, mm-hmm. like you clearly came to see me for some reason. Right. It's fine. Just because I'm here in my robe, freshly smelling of the sex I had with this beautiful woman. Like, let's not let's not address that. Let's just be cash. Right. Right. Because we're all adults here. It's cool. You know, <laughs> I love that. Oh, I love God. that that whole scene. So it's so much. fun. And I'm so glad that Giles is getting some. I think that that's good. Mm-hmm. Giles is a lovely, beautiful, healthy man. If he was not having sex, there'd be something wrong with the world. Well, that's a waste. <laughs> you know, assuming that that is something that he wants to be doing. It's not, you know, right. sex is wonderful. <laughs> I see you, my my asexual friends. I love you. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you are wonderful and beautiful and valid as well. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But but Giles needs to be having sex. I'm just saying. anyway, um... <laughs> so that you can have a rich fantasy life. I understand yes. where this is going. Like that is, I, it is purely yes. purely for me, just it's for me. Giles selfish. needs to be having sex. Yes. I'm just saying. No, I'm just the... saying. And that is the joy of fictional characters. <laughs> that is that is the joy of fictional characters. Um, so there are only a couple other like tiny things. Um, there's this. Oh, God, I don't know if this hit you in the gut the way that it did me. But when they were buying the books and Buffy says, can't wait until mom gets the bills for these books. I hope it's a funny aneurysm. Um, Oh, God. Oh, God. Because, of course, it is a brain aneurysm that that eventually gets Joyce. Joyce. Oh, God, it's so awful. And I hope it's a funny aneurysm. Oh, my God. So, like, yeah, this is one of those things that in the moment that it was written, you know, whatever. But that line is never going to be funny. That line is yep. never going to be enjoyable. That line is always going to be terrible. Um, so, yeah, so that kind of killed me. Then there's the the quick, she answers when she's home. She answers the phone. There's nobody there. That, of yeah. course, is a reference to Angel season one is starting right now. And in uh, Angel, the first uh, episode of that called City of, City of he yeah. calls her and you hear her answer the phone and he just hangs up. And it's just so sad. Yeah, and I genuinely was like, what the fuck? Because I completely mm-hmm. forgot about that. Oh, so you didn't know what it was. Yeah, it is. Of, I'm like, It's an extra wait, textual moment, you know. Is that supposed to be like, I was trying to make it make sense, and then I figured it out. I was like, yeah. all right. Because, of yeah. course, Angel, you know, and we know that Angel has been on Buffy's mind. Um, because, I mean, I love, actually, the opening shot where yeah. we see the angel in the cem- the angel statue in the cemetery yeah. and then Buffy's profile comes in and just eclipses that and we have mm-hmm. her in close up for the shot and it's just kind of this nice visual yeah. cue that like that's where her head is that her head mm-hmm. is with Angel and then of course when she goes to the bronze she sees the dude with the profile that reminds her of Angel and there's this yeah. moment of like is it him no Aww. it's not you know yeah. she's feeling really she's feeling so really sad. isolated and mm-hmm. he is the person who generally speaking she would go to especially with these like you know this this vamp 
situation on campus mm-hmm. because of mm-hmm. course Angel would know what to do about right. Sunday and these ridiculous vampires who I love so yeah. very much. We haven't I talked know. about. Oh my God, we got to talk about Sunday. Oh my God, I love Sunday. I love Catherine Town as Sunday. I think that she's fantastic. Um, and we only have her for this one episode, but I always remember her. Yes, she is. She is absolutely delightful. I love her so much. I love mm-hmm. her whole mean girl yeah. thing. I love just... <laughs> It's great. It's great. Everything about everything about Sunday is wonderful. Um, yeah. You know, even her even her fat shamey bullshit. I, even her I, fat shamey bullshit. I dig it. I'm here I for dig all of it. it. I like it. I like <laughs> that character. I like it from yeah. her. I like the delivery. Mm-hmm. I like her punk goth look. I love her just like can't even be bothered with how you know, boring. Yeah. All these freshmen are. And, right. you know, she is not phased by mm-hmm. Buffy being the slayer. She's just mm-hmm. like, all right, cool. I'm going to break your arm. <laughs> like, right. <I'm> like, <laughs> and I'm over She's here like, tell me more. <laughs> like, she just, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Oh, God. So you her- feel for like the, the sassy, you know, girl vampire the way that I feel about uh, dark British men, right? <laughs> Oh, yes. <laughs> like Spike mm-hmm. and Wesley yes. and all of that. Right? Yes. I get it. Spike, I get Dark it. Wesley. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Darla and, and Sunday are my <laughs> Spike and Dark that. Wesley. <laughs> I see that. Oh, and it makes this podcast just all the more fun. <laughs> <laughs> Except that I don't get as much of mine as you do of yours. You and don't. that's Well, I don't fair. get any Dark Wesley in, in the Buffy that's podcast. That's true. That's I get true. loads of him in Still Dead, the Angel podcast. But I don't get a lot of him here. But I do get a lot of spike and boy am i looking forward to that because it is season four and this is when this is it's spike's run four. we're getting it's there we're not going to see him for a couple of episodes but we're but, getting there and i can't oh but wait. when and when we get there oh oh, 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 oh. oh man yes. hello baby but we're not there yet noel <laughs> in this episode the freshman what are you wearing oh my god so we talked about new season new hair i love mm-hmm. that this is a thing that happens mm-hmm. i'm fucking yeah. that every season mm-hmm. everybody gets new hair um, i know you know and of course willow looks just fantastic i, I love, love her. her punky hair i love i love that haircut um yeah. i'm growing my hair out right now maybe i will you know, oh, you could do a punky hair. I could do a willow sort of a, you know, thing. spiky, flippy, spiky, thing. Yeah. flippy. Yeah, it's a good, it's it's good willow hair. I like that it's off of her face, so we can see yes. her beautiful face as she's so excited yes. about this whole mm-hmm. enterprise. I talked already about her looking a little bit taller than Buffy. I think Buffy mm-hmm. is wearing flip flops, and Willow's got a little bit of a, a yeah. platform, um, mm-hmm. which of course is so perfect because yes. You know, here she is just so confident and in her element and it's wonderful. Mm-hmm. Um, but and speaking of hair, Sunday's mm-hmm. little hair crown oh, right. is so cool. It's so mm-hmm. funky and like I don't I don't know if that was a thing in the late nineties. Uh-huh. I don't remember it being a thing. But when we first see her in her lair, she's got this headband on. Yeah. And then her hair is long in the back. But then in the front, it's like knotted up in these little tufts that sort of look like mm-hmm. she's wearing a tiara. Yeah. But it's, it's her hair. And I love that as a symbolic gesture that she is, she has made herself she's the, queen. the queen. Yeah. Yes. She's made herself the queen. She's sitting on this this throne throne Mm -hmm. you know just you know we eat when i say we eat she's Mm -hmm. made herself the queen of this frat house castle and of course of course the bad guys hang out in a frat house nothing good ever happens in a frat house nothing good ever happens nothing good ever happens in a frat house (laughs) oh i love our surfer dude too like there's something about having vampires because usually vampires are just growly dogs basically Mm -hmm. like there's nothing to them um you know we we characterize spike and drusilla we characterize darla a bit you know but like but we don't really get characterized bit player vampires and so it was kind of fun to have this surfer dude you know be all like whoa Whoa. (laughs) (laughs) and that is a bit that is a bit part that I just I always love yeah like I I realize that it's it's just 
the stupidest and it's you know right? talk about lazy writing right <laughs> just write a write a like a long hair surfer dude you know right That's lazy writing but for whatever reason that is a piece of lazy writing that i appreciate maybe it's because i'm like, from right. southern california where those oh, dudes maybe. exist <laughs> so, <laughs> they really do by the way like oh man yes they i exist. believe it I believe um, you. <laughs> but yes i like i like a vampire with some something beyond just growly animal Mm -hmm. um although i didn't know what to make of the opening sequence with the vampire Mm -hmm. coming out of the ground seeing you know like sneaking up on the girls in this like and the the music is this kind of jaws theme yeah you know riff and and then he sees the the weapons and yeah, he's like oh i guess i just won't then yeah and walks away and then buffy's like you know we gotta we gotta pay attention or whatever it was she was saying yeah. like, you know it was basically just a joke cold open you know but, um, all to set up the joke but why like <laughs> what why because they're like, not paying attention buffy's off her game yeah, yeah, yeah. i don't know yeah. i don't know i don't know like i love the i love the end with yeah. the vamp mm-hmm. getting tased by the commando mm-hmm. guys. And we're like, yeah. oh, holy shit. Game changer. <laughs> game changer. The game has changed. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, vampires with personality. More. I want yeah. I want more body diversity among our vampires. Mm-hmm. I want more right. personality among our vampires. Basically, I want, I want the show that is the um, point of view flip. Of right. the Buffy verse, I just want all the vampires. Just like give all me the all vampire the... stories. Yeah, right. give me all the little vampire oh stories. I want a series of vignettes about all these vampires and how they became vampires and like, uh huh, what their favorite <laughs> things are. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> well, we're gonna get we're gonna get some really great vampire stuff with Harmony. Harmony, honestly, oh god, is like my yes, favorite <laughs> vampire. My favorite vampire is Harmony. I love her so Harmony much. Harmony as a vampire really reinforcing the idea that no, the vampire does retain a lot of the original does retain a lot of what they originally were absolutely all right so noelle what is your girl power moment of the week i absolutely love buffy's you know princess bride i am not left-handed all right you know i only need yes. one moment yes. where she you mm-hmm. know turns around and just decks sunday with her her That's not nice. broken arm thank you very mm-hmm. much um and this is so minor but i love that buffy can read a map <laughs> Even if it's just a college campus map, a little empowerment. Sure. There's something just great about that where she just sidles up to Eddie and she's like, "Okay, here's this, here's that," you know. And he's like, I "It can't. makes sense, though. She always has to have a spatial awareness for yeah. all the fighting that she does. She has to know where shit is. Totally. You know? Yeah. I just I enjoy it. It's a mm-hmm. it's a cool bit of badassery, and you know, she's able I to like, like get them where they need to go. Mm-hmm. It's I very like nice. It. All right, Noelle, what's your favorite part of The Freshman? My favorite part is Catherine Town as Sunday. I, I love hear her so much. I She's hear fantastic. You. Fantastic. <laughs> what's your favorite part? Oh, God. Giles, when he rushes to Buffy and he says, I know I should be teaching you to be self-reliant, but I can't let you fight these monsters by yourself. And I am here. Point me at the evil. I love that whole thing. I love that whole thing. It is adorable. You know me. I mean, almost always my favorite moment is going to be Giles. Although when Spike shows up, they're going to have to duke it out. But it's always going to be one or the other of them because I just I love I love Giles so much. I love all of Giles. All right, that's it for today. To join in the discussion on Twitter, follow me at Lonnie Diane Rich and Noel at Noel Aloud and use the hashtag still pretty. Or you can keep Chipperish Media going to the tune of a dollar a month or more and gain access to the live chat in Discord where you can hang out with Lonnie and me and all the Chipperish patrons who are not supposed to have a private life because they're very, very old and it's gross. You can also show your support by giving Still Pretty a great review on Apple Podcasts or by telling your friends about the show or by dumping a bunch of very heavy books on the head of a floppy haired douchebag. We will be back next time with Living Conditions, the second episode of season four. Until then... We have to kill some cooler people. Will somebody remind me?